I know when we were in the administration, the work that you did for uh, the Affordable Care Act was Herculean, uh, and so we're excited to hear your perspective about building a bold policy agenda. Abdul, you've been with us, you've been in the arena, you've been part of the arena community, and have also been a candidate, and have been part of the community broadly within your home state of Michigan, where you're a graduate, where you went on to Columbia to get your, your MD, and then came back as a policy expert after, you know, going off and being a Rhodes Scholar to try and rebuild the Department of Health for the city of Detroit after it was um, privatized during the bankruptcy. And so we thank you for your work in your community. We thank you for putting your name out there to be a candidate for the Democratic nomination for governor of Michigan. And we're so excited for the conversation that you guys are about to have about building a bold economic agenda. Please welcome Nir and Abdul. You ever wonder what it means to make a by any means? <laughs> It's fantastic for me to be here with uh, so many future leaders of our country, uh, and I'm thrilled to be here with Abdul, who just came up an uh, incredibly inspiring and exciting race for governor. And I think one of the big issues is obviously the economy. The economy is a huge issue in Michigan, and I'd love for you to just share thoughts on the ideas you ran on and what were the what were the you know basically policy ideas that allowed you to really connect with so many people. Oh. I needed a mic. <laughs> but um, thank you for the, the question and uh, really excited to be here, um, especially with, uh, with somebody who uh, has been laying the groundwork for, for progressive thought for a long time. So I, I just want to give you a contrast of, of two stories. Um, I've got an uncle named Rick. And um, a lot of folks will look at my name and be like, wait, you've got an Uncle Rick? Um, <laughs> and my Uncle Rick, he's my, 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 my stepmom's uh, uncle. And um, my stepmom is a daughter of the American Revolution, has been uh, six generations in Michigan. My Uncle Rick voted for Donald Trump. You've got to imagine the awkward conversation uh, my Uncle Rick and I shared about, about his choice of, of votes. Um, and in fact, when you look at my uncle's choice, it has nothing to do with him having any adverse opinion about people of color or Muslims. It has everything to do with the economic reality in which he was living. He was a truck driver, and in 2008, he lost his trucking business, had to lay off people who he knew and loved from his own community, and in the ensuing eight years, watched as those folks could not get access to a good job. And that's largely because in our state, in our state, we've chosen to subsidize huge corporations and watch those corporations offshore and automate jobs in our state. And then as health commissioner in the city of Detroit, so many of the folks that I got to serve, you talk to single moms working two jobs and they're not making it in the economy either. And so thinking about what we have to do to propose a, a bold economic agenda, we have to ask ourselves, how do we thread the needle between the experiences of people like my uncle Rick and people like the folks that I got to serve in, in the city because they're suffering the same challenges. And those challenges have everything to do with the fact that we've sold off the sense of what creates jobs and what creates dignity to one system that just hasn't worked mm -hmm. and specifically hasn't worked in places like Michigan for a long time. Right. I mean, I think that's one of the big issues in the, in obviously we're all dealing in the Trump area, era, which is a constant effort to divide people against each other, right? So it's a constant effort to use racism, xenophobia, homophobia, hate of the other, uh, a Muslim ban, a whole range of issues to divide one group against the other. And I guess in your experience, how can we use economic ideas? Economics is actually uh, working class people of color, working class whites are dealing with the same kinds of struggles. So what, how can we actually use economics to drive uh, a sense of shared solidarity in the face of one effort to divide against another? I got, I got one really good piece of advice from a, a, a senior mentor of mine. He said, you know, Abdul, what everybody has is a pocketbook and everybody pays attention to their pocketbook. The other thing that everybody has is a body, and everybody pays attention to whether or not their body is working the way they want it to. And so when we think about what brings people together, oftentimes we do get divided. And then what happens is when they divide us, we come to rally for 
whatever group has been marginalized in the moment, and then they point us at us and say, well, you only exist to advocate for those small groups. Yeah. Rather than asking, how do we maintain our message about the solidarity that comes out of recognizing that it doesn't matter if you are a poor or working or retired white person in a place like Gratiot County, Michigan, or a poor or working or retired black person in a place like Detroit or Flint, or a poor or working LGBTQ individual in a place like Ferndale, or a poor or working or retired Hindu American uh, in a place like Rochester Hills, you've got a pocketbook and you've got a body. And how do we focus on threading the needle about the challenges that everybody in that circumstance has? And for us, it really was about talking about what an economy that was oriented toward, oriented toward workers and small business could look like in a place like Michigan, where for so long we, we had uh, assumed that manufacturing was going to persist. And in 2008, we watched as those huge corporations that had been so long the skeleton of Michigan's economy, they offshored jobs or they automated those jobs out. And in fact, state government was a part of making that happen. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it was about saying, well, what would happen in a state where we're the second biggest subsidizer of corporations in the entire country? What would happen if we said, you know what, we're not gonna subsidize big business anymore. And instead, we're gonna take that money, that 20% of the state budget, and start investing it in people and in the places where people live, learn, work, pray, and play. What would that economy look like? And how could we use the MEDC dollars that have gone on to big corporations to think about incubating small businesses, to think about scaling small businesses so that they persist in the state of Michigan and find home and roots in the state of Michigan? And if we did that, we could talk to people in places like Gratiot, we could talk to people in places like Detroit, and they understood that concept. Um, and it was very, very unifying in terms of how we could talk about a message that mattered for folks. And then the other aspect of that was healthcare. Yeah. So, I mean, I think one of the ideas that we've talked about the Center for American Progress and other people are talking about is a jobs guarantee, an idea that essentially we can have large-scale investment in infrastructure, in child care, in long-term care, challenges everyone has, really target those dollars in places, communities that have been left behind, rural and urban. And, you know, as you were talking about corporate structure, we just... The Washington just passed a $1.5 trillion tax cut that 81% goes to the wealthiest Americans. You could actually take that amount of money and invest in communities in Michigan, rural and urban, uh, as well as solve challenges we all know we have, infrastructure. The United States is the only developed country in the world that invests so little in childcare and long-term care. And I think that's one of the issues is, how do you change the entire framework? Yeah. Martin O'Malley earlier was talking about trickle-down economics. How do we change the entire framework away from tax cuts for business create jobs to investments in people create an economy that creates jobs? Did you see? Did you did you see that that different frame resonating in Michigan? And do you think people have sort of understood that uh, the whole way in which states try to lure business by giving them tax cut after tax cut after tax cut is is really a failing strategy? So one of the hardest problems, I think, and I, I'd love your opinion. It's not every day you get to pick near a tangent, <laughs> but, um, but but one of the hardest parts about politically communicating complex issues is that we often rely on data and statistics. And the thing about data and statistics is that they're not visceral. You don't feel them. Um, people understand stories and stories that are relevant to them and people that they know and engage with. And so being able to talk about what has happened in the, in the economy over the past 30 to 50 years is really quite hard because most people weren't around 30 or 50 years ago, and most people don't actually see the short-term glacier movement, right? They see 2008, which was the Titanic hitting the glacier, but they don't see the short-term glacier movement. And so being able to say, well, let's talk about exactly what happened and how much money left our economy and why over time. And here's the thing, right? So much of what we're talking about is said in the backdrop drop to Donald Trump. 
Because what he did so well was speak to economic anxieties. People don't appreciate that build a wall is not just immigration policy, it's economic policy. Why? Because if your central thesis is that the reason why there aren't jobs in your community is because brown people came and took your jobs and black people took all the handouts, which is Donald Trump's thesis, then build a wall seems to be a solution to that set of economic problems. And the problem is relative to what he's saying, everything that we're saying seems so much more complex and so much less obvious. Because the idea of a zero sum economy is something people take for granted. I get a job, you get a job. You take my job, I don't have a job, right? Versus actually jobs themselves have changed in nature. And so one of the things that we often talked about was saying, well look, how many corporate jobs in, in the actual factory that you used to work in, how many of those jobs are jobs anymore? Versus how many of them are robots and why? And why is it now in Michigan so much easier to buy a robot than to hire a person? And then beyond that, right, why is it that of the jobs that left, they left to places like Canada? So people don't understand this. In 2008, a lot of GM's jobs got offshored to Canada because GM was paying 15 cents on the dollar for every dollar that they took in on healthcare for retirees. So being able to have that conversation and being able to talk about why those things happened became how we had to communicate it. Now I wanted to ask you something. So we just saw Mayor Tubbs, and one of the most incredible things that is happening, I think, in America right now um, is the effort around thinking about universal basic income versus a, a jobs guarantee. And I, I'd love to just pick your brain because you know both of those are easy to understand topics, but a lot of them have pretty deep moral and ethical implications for how people think about the world, right? Who am I without my job? And you hear that in the, in the Midwest all the time, which is what's led to so much of this frustration. I mean, in, in your mind, how do we need to be thinking about both of those things, either in tandem or one or the other, and where do you see us going? Because in the end, this thing seems unsustainable. Yeah, no, I think both, both the universal basic income and a jobs guarantee are trying to address a simple problem, which is that we do not have enough jobs with dignity, particularly for people who do not have a college degree, right? 63% of Americans, I'm gonna rattle off some of the statistics, but 63% of Americans don't have a college degree. Upward mobility for people without a college degree has been a big challenge. Now, that's not just a problem in the white community, that's a problem for Latinos, people of color, Asians. The whole country has a major problem. It's not just an American problem. So the issue is, I think, particularly as progressives, how do we have a vision of upward mobility, a vision in which you can have a life of dignity regardless of a college degree? Because I'm a big, I'm a big supporter of ensuring people have a college degree but a lot of people may not. And I think that's one of the challenges that sadly Donald Trump really tapped into, which is how are my kids gonna do better than me when I, when I feel like I'm falling behind? I think both of these ideas are about trying to create an economy where people can live with dignity even if they, in a way, in a, in a, in a time when they haven't really felt like they can for many years. So. Uh, the jobs guarantee is a big investment in jobs and ensuring everyone has a job. Universal basic income is basically ensuring everyone has that income. I think one of the challenges or differentiators is essentially we have created a social structure where your, a lot of dignity for individuals comes from the work that they do. And so, uh, and we have to ensure that those jobs actually are ones with dignity, and one of the challenges is that we do have a big gender disparity, right? We think of infrastructure jobs as, or manufacturing jobs as ones, which are, are jobs that people want to have, but childcare jobs and nursing home jobs are a little bit shut to the side, and that is a big problem. We have to raise incomes for all kinds of jobs, service care, service jobs as well as manufacturing jobs. But I think one of the things that we're both saying with universal basic income and a jobs guarantee is that in a country as wealthy as ours, where we see so much of the benefits going up, that it's just absolutely ridiculous that we can't actually have major investments 
and the people who actually make this country great, which is all the people in our communities. And that we, this is another way in which we have to change the frame. And the deep irony of this entire last couple of years is that Donald Trump tapped into the, to the anxieties of your Uncle Rick, but he's governed with the interest of every single billionaire friend he has. And in that world that we're in, how we can't say, just take the money that you're adding to the coffers of the billionaires and give it to the, and ensure that people can have jobs actually improving the economy because infrastructure, childcare, these are all actually investments in human and physical capital. They both help the economy more than tax cuts that go to shareholders that just go to recycle money amongst the super elite and rich. Yeah, I think, I think um, the other part of the conversation mm -hmm. we haven't talked about, right, is that uh, we know that the share of work that actually goes in to manufacturing a product is going to decrease over time. That's just yeah. because of technology. But so much more of the jobs that are to be created are in human care, in service. And one of the issues, I mean, all politics is local. And in Michigan, one of the most interesting things was that home health care workers, which are a growing part of the service economy because we are an aging population, they get classified as domestic yeah. labor. Mm -hmm. And so they're not actually covered under labor laws. And so much of what we need to be thinking about, both as people like Donald Trump and Republicans generally continue to cut down and disempower the union movement, is about what and how unions are going to be representing in the future, because I think that's huge. The other thing about that is that we often don't think about healthcare as an economic issue. But we spend 19 cents on the dollar for every dollar spent on our an entire economy on healthcare. And a lot of that falls in terms of private expenditures, particularly if you have illness or you have an ill family member. And in Michigan, there's actually another aspect of that. We have some of the highest auto insurance rates in the country. We pay twofold the national average on average in Michigan. And if you live in a community like Detroit, you're paying fivefold the national average because we in effect have legal redlining laws. All of that is because we've allowed auto insurance to be billed for healthcare costs. It literally is a subsidy on health insurance. And so if we were to pass a state level Medicare for all type single payer program or Medicare for all at the federal level, in Michigan, not only would it cut out those healthcare related costs, but it would also bring down the cost of something like auto insurance, which in Michigan, there is no public transportation of any real report. So at the end of the day, that is a cost you have to pay. And so we estimated that just by passing what we were calling Michicare, we would save the average family earning $48,000 a year, $5,000. That's 10% of their take home right there just because of healthcare and because of auto insurance. And then you think about bargaining on prescription drugs if you're a senior and the ability to do that at the state level or to empower the federal government to do that. And that's another huge amount of savings for our seniors. And so when we think about the economy, we have to also just remember what goes into the pocketbook, what comes out of the pocketbook. And sometimes things that we don't classify as economics right, really are that way for so many people. Great, and just to add, just to add the point you made about unions, one of the things that's been uh, shocking really over the last eight years, 10 years, 12 years, is how many, how many states that used to lead the union movement in the United States, Midwestern states, states throughout the country have moved from being strong union states to right to work states. And one thing to say about this November is that we have the chance for the, for the first time to actually push back on right to work by electing people who will actually move states from being right to work to union states again. And, it, and what, why that's important <laughs> is the single, the single leverage point to reduce inequality in the United States, to raise wages, the one thing we know that works 
is to have strong unions. And this is another area in which the frame has been upside down because of a 40-year message war against unions. Unions raise wages for working class people, and yet the right has viciously attacked them to the point where in Michigan, they actually have passed and pushed efforts like right to work, Wisconsin right to work, Indiana right to work, Ohio right to work. So, as we think through how to change the game on the economy, one of the single things we can do is actually strengthen unions and actually vote at the local, state, and national level to protect unions as well. One last thing I want to say, and I, we've got the one minute exclamation point. <laughs> is just that you know one of the most moving aspects of running was was getting to really sit and listen uh, and speak with people who who work the kinds of jobs that many of us in this room don't mm -hmm. and there's one gentleman named Daryl he takes two buses to work every day he makes 11 bucks an hour cleaning a high school and he's had one raise in four years up from ten dollars an hour and Daryl kept apologizing to me because I was walking the day with him about how long his commute was. And we've got this culture in our society that we've allowed to fester where we think that when people, when people don't have means, it's because they have failed. That poverty is something to be shamed. That poverty is a failure, a human failure. And we as Democrats have to be leading the conversation about the structures that keep people in poverty in the first place. And about the fact that people like Daryl should not be apologizing for the fact that they have to take two buses to work and make 11 bucks an hour cleaning after kids in their community. Yeah, and we so, should apologize to him that that structure exactly. exists. And that's our moral fight right now. And so it's not just about policies. It's also about the moral character of our politics to be advocating for a society where we recognize that poverty is not a failure, that when people live in persistent poverty, it is a failure on our society and not on those people, and that we should be driving that conversation and have the courage to have that conversation against this cult of hard work like everybody's got bootstraps to be pulling up. Amen, brother.